Welcome to Season 7 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that's dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from around the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by Sing Chan Lim, who, who is otherwise known as Slim, who envisions a world where each and every one of us, from the moment we're born until the day we die, feel certain that there's at least one person we can reach out to at any given moment who can and will support us in a way that actually makes us feel supported. As an executive performance coach, Slim guides innovative founders to become the kind of CEO who can take their business to the next level without stress, getting the best of them on their employee, get, getting the best of them or their employees burning out. He has coached over 100 founders through Singularity University, Techstars, SAP, and Google. Prior to coaching, Founder SEO, Slim spent the first half of his 22-year career helping Fortune 500 companies and the Department of Defense design innovative high-tech products and services. Innovations he has helped produce have won a number of awards, including the CES Innovation Award, and his first book is entitled Realizing Empathy, which is absolutely a gorgeous book, a soulful book. I highly recommend it. Welcome to the show, Slim. Thank you for having me and just so generous of you to actually read the entirety of my bio. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's such a, it's a beautiful, it's a poetic uh, bio. It's not just sort of like giving me the, the snapshot. It's kind of giving me a sense into what matters to you and what, and the values that, that inspire you. So I'll start with like a very simple question, which I'm sure is going to require uh, more than a simple answer. How is realizing empathy different from just having empathy? So the reason why I coined the phrase realizing empathy while I was writing the book was because I was going through a, a series of experiences that I couldn't explain. And the experience was basically, and, and, and I'm going to say this uh, as my past self, because as I admit how I was in the past, there's a part of me that's, that feels a little bit ashamed <laughs> uh, about the fact that I was this way, you know, uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So I used to be very judgmental of artists. <clears throat> uh, I'm a traditionally trained computer scientist. Like if you tell me to solve problems, I'll figure out a way to solve problems. If you tell me to analyze things, I would analyze it in the, in the most precise ways possible. And maybe part of that training has influenced me, part of other societal uh, influences, but Basically, I, when I looked at artists, they, to me, looked, at, I mean, looked like a bunch of self-indulgent narcissists who weren't actually contributing anything to society. <laughs> they were just like doing whatever they wanted that pleased them, that made them feel good. And I was like, what exactly do they do? Like, you know, what, what use or value could they possibly have if all they do is sit around making stuff they want? That's actually genuinely how I felt and thought in my 20s, throughout my 20s, right? And one of the things that happened when I went to art school to do the research for my book is all these assumptions and biases and judgments I had against artists started to crumble one by one, right? And it was a four-year-long journey that I went on. So it wasn't like an overnight thing. Like it, it took me four years to get, get rid of as basically every single judgment and bias and assumption I had, had about artists, right? But the, the, the way I, but I couldn't explain like how this was happening. So the only thing that I could, uh, only phrase I could come up with was I was having realizations that was changing my perspective and, and my mind about artists. But it wasn't any old realization. The realization had a component of empathy. Like I, there was something about me having felt like really disgusted and disconnected and separated from artists. And then now I was feeling closer to them. I was feeling more connection with them. And I really appreciated their presence in my life. So the fact that I was moving from one place of separation, disconnection, and disgust to another place where I felt connection and uh, uh, appreciation and, and, and closeness to these people, the fact that these realizations were at the heart of that, I really genuinely wanted to capture that because it was so profound for me, right? So at the time, the, the phrase that I came up with was realizing empathy. Now, 
while I was on tour, give, getting all these questions about people judging other people for lacking empathy, I, be, I eventually realized, first of all, I'm not alone. <laughs> so the vast majority of, I mean, I think, I think every single one of us can, can come up with a relationship where we felt really disgusted by somebody or felt like fairly disconnected or separate from them and very judgmental against them. And if my memory serves and if, if my experience has anything about those relationships, there's a possibility, not that this will inevitably happen, but there's a possibility that if we can somehow uh, get a number of realizations to happen in those relationships, we can actually move from not empathizing with those people to empathizing with those people. And that, that transformative experience became kind of at the heart of what I, was, uh, what I really wanted to, to express through my book. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so I kind of see the word realizing almost as a double entendre. So one is like realizing as in like achieving it, but the other one is realizing it as in like insight. So is that? Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. So I think, I think the, 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 ins- I think the, the achieving is kind of elusive because we can't will ourselves to have realizations. Right. So it, it actually requires a bit of surrender, <laughs> It requires a little bit of like leap of faith to actually be able to have this realization. Nobody knows when and how we're going to actually arrive at this realization, right? But, but in my mind, when we judge other people for not having empathy, or do we come up with all these sort of rationales about like people have or lack empathy, I think that actually is kind of a, a, an indication that we need to pause and, and ponder the possibility that maybe there's something in this relationship where if I could go through an experience where I have a series of realizations, maybe those judgments will no longer hold true. And there may be a way for me to actually create a sense of connection with these people where I no longer question the idea whether people have or lack empathy. It becomes kind of a mood point. And then it's all about me being able to go on a journey of realizing empathy and then being able to to actually reap the benefit and value of having these insights that I could not have otherwise had. So that's a very long-winded answer to your very short, simple question. <laughs> right. But it's very helpful because your book is entitled Realizing, Realizing Empathy, and you've built you know, a body of work around that concept. So it's good to have that as a baseline. What makes realizing empathy so difficult then? Yeah. So first of all, I mean, back to the idea that it's out of our control. Mm-hmm. It, it, I think so, so if you ask me like 20, you know, like once again, like the, the major theme is me before, before going to art school and after art school, right? this is me like the most profound experience I've ever had in my life is in my 20s, I'm now in my mid, mid 40s and in my, in my 20s, I basically was the type of person that you would, you would characterize as like type A, you know, go-getter, you know, high achiever, that sort of a person. Like, I was like, I had like a one year, three year, five year plan and like I had check boxes. Like, I mean, like achieving was very, very, very important for me, right? So, so the fact that I'm now thinking about this sort of like realizing empathy where I actually have no way of controlling any, me having any realizations or, or once again, like achieving something like, like putting that aside is already a, a, a kind of like a, a, a it makes me very uncomfortable. It's already in the difficult realm because it's out of our control. Right? So that's, that's one, uh, that's like the most basic dimension of what makes realizing empathy so difficult is first of all, the fact that accepting that it's, it's, out of our control right but the interesting the second part that i find interesting is even though it is out of our control it doesn't mean there isn't something we can do right Mm -hmm. and so this is what i find very critical about the idea of responsibility right so if we were to bring in a little little additional idea into the conversation i often discern between uh fault uh, or accountability and responsibility right accountability is like somebody will hold me accountable because of social contract issues. Like, you know, Hey, you're supposed to be in charge of X. I'm in supposed to be in charge of X. If you don't, if, if something goes wrong, it's your fault. You know, you're going to be accountable. There's that, but there's also responsibility. And, and the, the, the nuance that I want to discern is the way I, in which I think about responsibility is my ability to respond. Right? It's responsibility. So even though something like realizing empathy is out out of my control, technically, I think we can actually take responsibility, meaning we can actually choose to respond to this seemingly 
uncontrollable and insurmountable situation of we can't like will our way to uh, realization we can still take the responsibility to do something that increases the possibility or the probability that we will eventually realize empathy right? mm-hmm. so that to me is very very important but here's where it gets difficult taking that responsibility is very difficult right so number one um I, not everybody knows how to take that responsibility, right? Because it's not merely an, a, a cognitive thing like, oh yeah, I will do my best. Like, but, but what, are you, what exactly are you going to do, right? And then you can say things like, well, I'm going to listen and I can do all these things, but, but, but for how long, <laughs> how many people, there's all these variables that come into play. So even simply choosing to take the responsibility actually is not a, 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 an easy thing to do. I think it really requires something that you that that is very personal to you that you're willing to put that that there's something at stake is very personally important to you probably then and only then will you actually even take the responsibility that's my guess right but after number two like let's say like for for myself this is the work is very personal to me so i'm very much willing to take this responsibility to do whatever i can to realize empathy so let's say I, I, I took one step further. Having done that doesn't mean the, the journey's done. Like right? there's still like the actually journeys are started, right? Then how are you gonna actually do this? And, and how for how long and, and how many people? It's gonna take time, it's gonna take energy. And not only time and energy, there are, there are gonna be situations where it's gonna be very, very, very difficult because of the emotional content of the relationship, right? For example, I'll just give you a very personal example. So my father and I did not have a very, very, uh, what would you call it? Very intimate or close relationship for most of our lives, right? So it wasn't until after I published my book and I had all these experiences of my own and, you know, did a bunch of other stuff. And then I happened to be invited back to Korea to give a talk about my book. And now I'm like, at the, at the, at the time it was like 2000. 14 or maybe like 14 or something like that so like like maybe like two years after the book was published I went went to give a talk about my book in Korean for the very first time in my entire life uh and I invited my father to come to the event right and once again up until that very moment our relationship wasn't very good (laughs) and I was already in my mid 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 30s so there was something happened. I mean, it's too long of a story to get into, but something happened during that event. And my father actually then reached out to me and talked about how proud he felt to see me having grown up. Because in his mind, like because of the lack of communication we've had for such a long time, like it, it, I, I'm guessing now I'm trying to take his perspective, like it probably wasn't very clear to him how I grew up. Like, I mean, he, you know, he, you know he, him and my mother gave birth to me, but like our relationship wasn't very close. So he didn't really get to see much of what how was happening as I was growing up. So thanks to the talk, I was now even willing to have like slightly longer conversations with my father than in the past. Which, like in the past, it was like, like less, less than 30 seconds. So longer is like three minutes. Where, like now it's better, but it was like slightly longer conversations. But to me, to get to that point was like 35 years. There was a lot of tension. There was a lot of something in between us uh, that wasn't going to make realizing empathy very easy or even possible. So I think even after you take the responsibility, there's a lot of stuff that has to be dealt with in between for us to be able to make a progressive step towards that journey. So I want to make sure that we all acknowledge the humanity that is inherent in the idea of realizing empathy to really recognize that this is not something we can kind of point fingers and tell people, oh, you should just do it. No, no, no. Only, only individuals can choose to do it because it's a huge ordeal. And if they choose it, they, they deserve the appreciation and recognition that anybody deserves in exercising the courage required to actually take that first step. So I just want to make sure that we keep and maintain the gravitas of what it is that we're talking about when it comes to empathy, especially in tumultuous times like the one we're in now. So instead of thinking about how, 
how we can quickly realize empathy or, or what are some quick and simple practices we can do as, as lovely as those things are and useful and practical, practical as those things are. I also want to make sure that we, we really uh, hone in and pay attention to the, and, and acknowledge the fact that realizing empathy is very, very, very difficult because the mere act of acknowledging the difficulty around realizing empathy, I think makes a lot of people feel less alone and maybe even a smidgen more likely that they're willing to take responsibility towards uh, the journey of realizing empathy. From your engineering background, the judged artist, you decided to do a four-year art degree. So why? Okay, so okay, so what's the short version of this? So two incidents happened between me judging artists and me actually arriving in art school. The first was <clears throat> I was... I was going through an existential crisis, let's call it, <laughs> and which was basically I had devoted a, nearly a decade of my life in a field called human-centered design. Right? And for those of you who don't know, I mean, ironically, human-centered design is design with empathy. Like, how can you actually have more empathy with customers so that we design products that they actually need, as opposed to designing whatever the hell we want and then figuring out an advertising campaign to persuade people into buying what they don't need which is the way things used to work and sometimes still do, right? So that's the field that I sort of cut my teeth in for about a decade. And, and really, I felt like I dedicated my youth. That's the way it felt, right? Because all my 20 was gone by the time I left that field. So I was having an existential crisis because once again, I felt like I had dedicated my youth and yet uh, I didn't really see any impact. I mean, it was a lot of fun. I mean, no doubt about it. It was like the most fun career I think anybody could have is like you're, you're empathizing with all these customers and trying to find out what they really need and designing things that that would potentially fulfill their need like there's nothing that could be more fun <clears throat> except at the end of the day what we do is we uh we make a book that says all right we've done this bunch of research uh so here's what you should do either to depart to the uh, department of defense or the fortune 500 companies that we were working uh, working for now it's up to them to execute. It's sort of like you have contractors who can build buildings and architects who draw buildings. <laughs> we were the architects. We drew the buildings, but we weren't actually going to build them. So they actually had to build it. Well, uh, luck would have it. 90% of the time, it never got built. It just didn't. <laughs> For a variety of reasons, it just didn't, got, didn't get built. So after 10 years, I had some things to show. And, but the vast majority of things I had to show were like things that could have been amazing <laughs> had it seen the light of day, right? So we can imagine like somebody who was like in, her, in his 20s, like full of blood and I want to have impact and all that kind of stuff going on to spend his entire youth arriving at this point where like there's little, little there's very little to show uh, and, 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 and this feeling of like, do I really matter kind of a thing starts to seep in. So massive existential crisis. And at the time, the way I processed existential crisis was I blamed the CEOs. So you can see the pattern of me back then, right? It's like I find somebody to blame and then I blame them. It's like, ah, so it's their fault. Like I did everything I could. I took responsibility. They are not taking responsibility. These horrible CEOs, these greedy bastards who know, you know, who only know money or whatever the, the rationale I had. So these Fortune 500 companies, and because I didn't know these CEOs firsthand, what exactly they were thinking or what they're going through, they were the easiest to blame in hindsight, right? So that, that's the one thing that was happening. The second thing that, was ha that had happened was I griped about this with a bunch of PC people who are senior to me, like people usually 10 years older than I was. And one of the wise women that I met during that period of seeking uh, advice from my uh, 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 senior people who are senior basically had had the patience to listen to all of my gripes for a very long time and eventually said and she didn't exactly say this I don't exact I don't remember what she exactly said but this is what I heard <laughs> okay what I heard was slim you're saying this because you're immature hmm. <laughs> that's what I heard right hmm. so after patiently <clears throat> hearing what I had to say the response I heard was, Slim, you're saying this because you're immature. And I was like, 
like what huh <laughs> what did i just hear i have no idea like once again i'm sure she didn't actually say that this is the way i heard right so i, I was like what, what 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 exactly do you mean like say more and she basically helped me realize that she was or was originally a painter she was a bona fide fine art painter who had uh had her mentor tell her basically the basically the same thing that she's telling me and saying that she needs a different perspective <clears throat> and then she was advised to go get a degree in the sciences and she did so she went to mit and got a degree in computer science uh and and she came out and then now she was in the field of of, of, of human centered design and all that kind of stuff right so she was kind of like if you look at it now like she was it's the opposite direction of the, the, the journey that I traveled, right? So she had, she was 10 years young, uh, older than I was. She, so she had already came back from that journey. And now she was saying, I guess from her own experience and sort of like when I was your age kind of a thing. Um, Slim, you're saying that because you're mature. Here's my advice. Go to art school. Hmm. And, and, and I don't want to make this sound like a romantic, you know, all of a sudden, like when I heard that story, I was like, oh, oh. like, no, 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 that's not how it happened. I was fighting tooth and nail to the seemingly irrational advice I got from a person who was supposed to be senior. Cause I'm like, what, what, like you're, you're, you're like a, a IBM fellow. <laughs> you're, you're, you're an esteemed, you know, designer and engineer and all these things. And, and the only advice you can, and this is me thinking, I'm not actually saying this, sir. The only, you know, advice you can give me as a senior is this like, you know, out of nowhere, blue sky, fluffy thing about me should I, me going to art school? It makes absolutely no sense. So I, I kind of like that, that conversation didn't really go anywhere. I sort of like brushed it off. But then I came back home and I'm, I don't know if, if you had a similar experience at all, but <clears throat> you, sometimes you hear something from somebody and you don't like it, but then you lie down to go to sleep but you can't go to sleep because that thing is ringing in your ears. And I think to me, that's, that's a sign that there's something there, right? On the surface, I don't really like it, but there's something there, right? So long story short, I spent the next year uh, with the hypothesis of, all right, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be the scientist that I am. I'm going to have a hypothesis, which is if her advice has any merit whatsoever, me, without actually going to art school, if I just took an art class, <laughs> but just a single art class, I would have the most profound, profoundly transformative experience ever. And then I would like all of a sudden, you know, uh, be, be moved to actually take action in this seemingly irrational advice. So that's my hypothesis. Once again, you can tell that I have a very uh, a kind of a a devious way of setting up the hypothesis so that I can, ne I can never work. <laughs> so that, but then I was willing to experiment. So I was like, I took a night art class at a nearby art Institute, took a single class in, in what's called drawing from observation. And like miracle, I took that one class and I did have that life shifting. Oh. Um, so at the end of that, I, I had persuaded myself. I was like, oh my God, I had no idea what it is that artists do. Absolutely no idea. It's like zero. Yet I had assumed I knew everything <laughs> about what they did. And then a single class had completely broken uh, open this, 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 this gate, a floodgate started to open. I'm like, well, if I'm wrong about this, what else could I possibly be wrong about? And at that point, it, now it, like my achievement uh, mode kicked in. I was like, okay, how can I get into art school? <laughs> so now it was a matter of like figuring out like, like a very brilliant engineer, like reverse engineering the application process and making sure I have a good great portfolio and all those stuff. And I, you know, and I, I finally, finally was able to, with, with luck and, 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 and coincidence, get into an art school that was that, sort of continued on that transformative experience for me for the next four years. Today's episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. 
Um, as a final question, Slim, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you so much. Your enthusiasm just still so, uh, is, I can feel it uh, even across a Zoom call. They blabber her on. <laughs> no, no, no. It's great. It's wonderful. It hasn't dimmed at all in, in 10 years since I, I met you or nine years, I think we calculated. <laughs> um, I love asking my guests at the end of the show if they can think of a story or a time in their life where they were on the receiving end of empathy and what that meant for them. So can you think of one and what that meant for you? Yeah. So, so, so this, this is a story that I don't think I've told anywhere in public, like, like a, a broadcast setting. So I'm, I'm privileged to, to finally be willing to admit this story in, in, in a very public setting like this. So this is about my, about my wife, right? So my wife and I dated for nearly 10 years before we got married. So I don't know, I don't know about the culture that you're in, but the culture that I'm uh, uh, kind of used to, that's a freaking long time. And a vast majority of people will be like, you have commitment issues. Or, or my mother would say, uh, you're, you're taking her for granted. Like all, all sorts of judgments are flying around my vicinity about how wrong it was to sustain that relationship for that long. And I think uh, on a very logical level, I admit that wasn't probably the right thing to do. I fully admit to that, right? Having said that, the logical part, um, the thing that, that I want, the, the story I want to tell was, I think in the beginning, the, 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 the rationale that I had for not getting married, I think was, um, I, I sort of looked at the, the role models of people who got married around me. Right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't have any, like zero. Like not a single married people around me was something that I actually aspired to be like when I got married, like not even one. So I was very, very unsure that I could do any better. So if that's the case, like why get married was sort of my sort of cerebral way of thinking about this, right? So that was sort of my kind of way of continually justifying being in a non-marriage uh, relationship. And thankfully my wife, you know, stayed in it with me, but here's where everything changed. I got, and, and, and you know, uh, spoiler alert, I got, I got married. <laughs> right. uh, but here's what happened in between. So one of the things that happened in my relationship with her was in 2000, end of 2013, beginning of 2014, she got stuck in Korea. So she was basically on a routine travel to Korea, visiting her parents. And, uh, you know, she has an artist. Visa, so she's, an, she's a fine artist. She has an artist visa to stay in the U.S., and her artist visa was approved by the federal government. Everything was wonderful. And then she just, she just had to visit her family overseas. And the formalities that uh, are inherent part of the, 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 the O-1 visa process is uh, while you hold an O-1 visa as an artist, if you ever go, uh, out, if you go outside of the U.S. and wish to come back in, you have to visit the U.S. consulate in that country and do some kind of a return interview. And they say, it's just a formality, you know, no need to worry about anything. It's just kind of a return thing. And she did that once in the past and she had no problem coming back in. So she just thought, oh, whatever. Now, the second time she went back, still to this day, nobody knows exactly what happened. But the interview, the, the person who was interviewing uh, my girlfriend at the time didn't seem to like her. And the kind of questions that my, my girlfriend was, at the time was, was getting was, Oh, so you're an artist. How famous are you? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> like number one, I don't even know how to answer that question. And I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? And then the line of questioning was very weird. It wasn't anything like the kind of questions that she received in the past. And she felt very uncomfortable answering these questions and she did whatever she can. And then eventually, uh, you know, she was sent home without an actual stamp. And she, she was basically told to wait. And, and I don't know if this is true of Canadian government, but if you know anything about the US government, if anything goes back and, and, and the government says to wait, that's not a good sign. And long story short, that wait lasted three years until her visa expired. And, and all this time, she was stuck in Korea. She could not uh, come back into the U.S. And she's still in a very similar situation. We're going through an immigration process that's different now that we've gotten married, but still not that different because 
of the opacity and, and she still hasn't been able to come back in. So this is an ongoing story. But so when that happened, the, when the first installment of that happened back in 2014, uh, my world crumbled. My entire world just crumbled. Right? And I like, like talk about anxiety that I experienced in art school. Like now this was even, even higher. Like it was like, I just couldn't think straight. And I felt like everything, like nothing was stable in my life. It just felt like everything was crumbling. It was like a gigantic earthquake throughout my entire life. That's what it felt, right? And it really tested our relationship. I started to get, I started to like snap at her, like got really angry at her. I mean, obviously, like in hindsight, I was just starting to like release my own, of like own feeling of shame of like, what could have I done to prevent this? I was ashamed of myself for like, having like i call myself her boyfriend i i claim to love her and yet i was unable to do anything to prevent this from happening how dare you call yourself all these things that's what was actually really going on but never never in a, in a light of day i would admit to that so all these things were coming out as anger and frustration and and all these other things at, at my at the person who was actually feeling even more tumultuousness uh, at the time right so it was testing our relationships in ways it was never tested before, right? And, and, and I, it was going on for like several weeks and I was coaching, I was already coaching somebody at the time. And one of the things that the CEO was struggling with was asking for help. So the situation was uh, the CEO was having all these, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, issues with, with his employees. And the thing that he, he needed was, uh, the insights the employees had of the customers that they're interacting with, right? And the reason why the CEO needed it was because the CEO have, was having trouble coming up with a clear vision of the future of the company. And no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't come up with it because he was so far removed from the customers and he really needed to go back. But his relationship with these employees were already not so great. So he was unwilling to take the first step to actually go to the employees admit that he didn't have any vision and the only way in which he can get the vision is if he can get some answers that the employees had from the customers but that he had such a difficult time asking for that help from the employees right so i was helping him walk walk through this and and working up the courage to how how to have this conversation such that his shame is less and all these kind of things and role playing and practicing all that stuff and while i was helping the ceo at one point, I started to see a mirror of myself exactly doing the same thing with the CEO. I was, I realized that, all, like, just like I said before, I was feeling super ashamed of the fact that I was unable to do anything as a boyfriend at the time. And what I really needed to hear from my, my girlfriend at the time was, it's not your fault. You didn't cause this to happen. It's going to be okay. But like, but I can't possibly expect to hear that from somebody who's actually stuck in the other side of the country. But this is the humanity that lives in us. It's like, this is what I really needed to hear. But I was unwilling to ask for that from my, my girlfriend. That like, like in a flash of a, of a second, as I was coaching the CEO, I became very clear that I was in the exact same situation as a CEO. I was unwilling to admit to my own shame and actually asked for the support of my girlfriend. So I, I, I came off of that, that call and I was like, okay, <laughs> am, am I going to be able to do this? Because <laughs> uh, I, I was like, I need a coach. <laughs> I'm like, how, well, how am I going to, how am I going to approach this? I'm like all sorts of like stuff. With it. I felt like I was back in high school and I had a crush on a girl. And I was like writing down a script of like, what am I going to talk about when I get on the phone with this girl with whom I have a crush. It was like, it, was like, it felt exactly like that, right? So I went through all that like scripting, right? And like, like, I was like, I got on the phone eventually. I called my wife, a, a girlfriend at the time who was stuck in Korea. And I said, Yongju, that's the, Yongju's her name. I'm about to say something. <laughs> and you don't have to respond right away. You know? And if it, if it, if it comes across in, in, in all the weird ways, just, just, you can just hang up. <laughs> I like, I started like put all sorts of arbors and then protections up the wall. Cause I was so afraid. Cause I, I was, in my mind, I was, I was super, uh, I was, I was sure of myself that the moment I admit how ashamed I feel, what she's going to say is not, no, it's not your fault. It's like, yeah, 
You didn't do anything. You were not there for me. Maybe we should break up. That's to me, that's the, the inevitable thing I was going to hear. And she was going to leave me. Like as, as, as irrational as that may sound, that's how it felt in that moment. That's what's going to happen. So basically I'm digging my own grave by admitting my shame to this person. The only person who I have in my life who I can actually count as my support, me going on this crazy journey of empathy <laughs> back then, right? So I, I, you know, did all this protection and I said, you know, what I, and I said, what I said, what I said is like, I think what's really going on is this, is I'm feeling all this shame about not being good enough as your, as your, as your boyfriend. And I really need to hear from you that you're, that it's not my fault and that you're actually willing to support me, <laughs> despite the fact that I'm not the one stuck overseas. And here is the amazing purposeful empathy <laughs> that I like will never forget until the day I die without batting an eye. She immediately say, Oh, that's what you need. How can I support you? Like, like what? Like, there was zero hesitation. No questions asked. She was just saying, how can I support you? And it was so different from what I'd imagined would actually genuinely going to happen. It like brought tears to my and it's, I'm still kind of like a little bit getting teary eyed right now as I, as I tell this story. But I would never forget that moment where somebody who was who, who's supposed to be the one who's stuck overseas and should be the one on the receiving end of empathy. Hears from somebody on the other side in the U.S. all comfortable and safe, saying that he needs to feel supported. She is needs empathy. And in, in response to something like that, actually turns around and says, how can I support you? That, that is amazing. And, and once I heard that, there was, there was just everything, everything changed. Uh, just everything changed. And, and I think in many ways that, that still to this day uh, is sort of, sort of the highlight of my life and where I really felt like, you know, true empathy. Uh, I, was, I, was in, in, I was in the presence of it. Even though she will say like, oh, I mean, like, what else? I mean, I was very nat- and she, she sort of like says it very nonchalantly like oh yeah of course blah 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 but from the receiving end to me that's the important part it was it was such a life altering moment when I received that empathy so that story you know, came and it kind of echoes so much of Brené Brown's work right where where shame lives we are so guarded because we feel so poorly about ourselves and that if we allow any bit of vulnerability out we're going to have more shame dumped on ourselves, right? Like we just believe that it's going to just backfire. When in reality, and I was just interviewing another woman, a researcher at Stanford saying that one of the things that we underestimate is how positive compliments land for others. We also underestimate- Oh, Chuan's work. Yes, Chuan. Yes, that's right. That's right. And the third thing in this series of, of the way we overestimate or underestimate how we think about each other, um, she says, we overestimate how much people will judge us based on when we talk about you know, our failures or things that are not going well in our lives. So I guess your story just suggests, the, the big takeaway there from the story is that if we're feeling defensive and shame about something, that if we lean into it, obviously you have to kind of choose people kind of wisely, I guess, right? Because there are some psychopaths out there that could abuse of it. But if we lean into the shame and show vulnerability, people will really step up for us and, you know, will help kind of will flood us with all the right emotions to sort of help that shame dissipate. That's what it sounds like happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's, even even if even if they're not psychopaths, I think there will be people who are resent who are holding grudges or resentment, just like I how I was, who was unwilling to respond to my father, for example. The, mm. the, the, the numerous times that he tried to reach out to me, I was just like not having it, right? So God forbid I'm not a psychopath, but I'm, I still responded in a, in a horrible, harsh way to my father for you know 30 something years. So so that aside, I think that I think the the degree to which you overestimate, I think is spot on. Like we tend to think every single person in the entire world would respond in a negative way. I don't think that's true. There are definitely people who can and will respond in a way that is not that way. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and it does require either a leap of faith or some kind of support that you can get to a point where you feel like you, you are able to exercise the courage required to do it. Because I don't think courage just, just happens like that. I mean, that's, that's mm-hmm. not so easy. And this is why I think uh, like the, the, the thing that, that really um, for me helped once I heard that was I, the, the courage that I exercised in my relationship to my then girlfriend actually gave me courage to sustain the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I received support from my wife and, and I was able to, because of the support I got, the other stuff that I was fending, I, I had the strength to actually to confront that and to be able to confront my wife I think in some vicarious ways, my coaching the CEO actually was the reverse support because I saw that I was not alone by coaching someone. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. I often joke that like, you know, like, yeah, as much as you pay me, like there's, there are times when I learn a lot simply from coaching other people. So I think That's it's because a, a we're way. human. That's exactly what it is, right? <laughs> so this, that, 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 that sort of reciprocal interdependent cycle that I think is, is, is very, very much part of what it means to be a human being. I think so long as there's some way to make that support happen in a variety of different dimensions, the, the place where we don't feel supported, we can get the support from there because of the other support we have elsewhere. So, yeah. so it all has to fit in in this gigantic system of mishmash and, but if, if the more we try to, you know, self-sufficient and all that kind of stuff, it just breaks these connections and makes it less likely that we're actually going to be able to be the human that we have the potential to be. So uh, with that, I'm going to, the bottom line takeaway for me through our conversation is that realizing empathy is so much about surrender, about uh, grace and about healing. And, um, just want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing and the conversation we had today slim thank you thanks for everybody who was watching and listening and we'll see you next week it was fun please stay beautiful <laughs> what if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter make that important decision liberate you from whatever is holding you back at grant here in international you get to choose the coach of your choice anytime from anywhere Visit International.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.